today. Um, I'll say some words after, but once again, thanks for coming to Free Thought Fest. This is awesome. Um, thank you. Um, oh, I also found someone's room key. If uh, someone's looking for their Lowell Center room key, it'll be near the water cooler over there. So just take it if you think it's yours or whatever. Um, anyway, she's the outreach director for the Center for Inquiry and the director for African Americans for Humanism. Please welcome Debbie Goddard. Yay! Hello. Hello. So, I'm glad that some people stayed for the end of the conference. Um, no, it's really good. I know it's a long day, and I appreciate it. And the, do I sound okay? I'm getting a little bit Perfect. of cool. I'll ignore the ringing that's happening up here slightly. It's all in your head. I hope so. I was revising my presentation, and then I had a hard time printing out my slides, which is why there was a delay. I do apologize for that. But it's partly because some of what I was going to talk about, Jesse Galef covered excellently this morning. Um, I was going to talk some about the campus movement, the student movement, past, present, future. And he talked about that. Um, he also summed up some of why the student movement is important, which of course is a big part of why we talk about the student movement. You know, I believe the students are the future, that sort of thing. And so I tried to amend the presentation to complement his, to talk about some of the things he hasn't covered. Um, and also, Ben has sort of persuaded me to do something that I was only half-heartedly joking about yesterday, which was the Debbie Goddard Storytime Hour uh, presentation. Where is the speaker? Above you. If you get close enough, the bats come out. OK. Um, and to start with a personal story that I've told a couple of times at different events over the years, because I've been involved for a while. But I will share it with you. And I guess, oh, there is a clock. Cool. So first, see the student movement passed. By student movement, I'm talking about organized student groups and conferences and organizations, whether national or international. A lot of the information hasn't been written down. I think, actually, Hemant may have put some together in his recent book. But um, I've gained some knowledge about some of it over the years, and I'll talk about that, my kind of more personal perception of the student movement. So I wrote some notes to self because I wasn't around at the beginning of it, um, so I could share that with you. Um, national program or organization-wise, um, a lot of the national level organized free thought movement started with the Campus Free Thought Alliance. It was founded in 1996. The Council for Secular Humanism, which is an organization that's kind of part of and affiliated with the Center for Inquiry, brought together seven college students to the headquarters outside of Buffalo, New York. The students already had groups at their campuses, but this is 1996, so there's not that much interneting going on. They're not really communicating with each other. They wanted to establish a network. I'm seriously going to. I have things to gesture to, so that might be worrisome, but I'll try to, to adjust. The seven students wanted to establish a network of non-believers and rationalists on university and college campuses across North America. They were concerned by the rising tide of religious and political extremism and anti-scientific outlooks among young people, as well as the lack of a strong and supportive community for non-believers. As you might expect, some came from religious families, and so community building was very important to them. I think I broke it. <laughs> the students agreed that there were dangers inherent in the present religious assaults on academic freedom, civil liberties, and scientific literacy. They outlined their concerns in what was called a Declaration of Necessity, which they distributed online. The New York Times actually reported on that Declaration of Necessity, too. Within a year of the founding, there were 40 campus groups affiliated with the Campus Free Thought Alliance. 
The Secular Student Alliance started in 2000, four years after the, found, the founding of the Campus Free Thought Alliance, when some of the student members on the executive council of the Campus Free Thought Alliance wanted to create a democratically run, independent student organization, and so um, created SSA. Uh, just a word of note there, because there's nothing that exists called the Campus Free Thought Alliance anymore. It has changed its name. In 2004, the Campus Free Thought Alliance and the high school version, the Young Free Thinkers Alliance, which I'll talk about in a bit, combined, and they called it CFI on Campus. So part of the reason for that was because atheism and free thought wasn't enough, and it wasn't all that CFI did. We also had skeptics groups, for example, and science advocacy groups. So they wanted a broader banner than free thought. So the Center for Inquiry has a pretty broad mission. They changed it to CFI on campus also, so it would be clearer what it was affiliated with. So that's a little bit of the official history of CFI's campus outreach program and the student movement. I mean, there's lots of details in there. And Jesse talked a lot about the Secular Student Alliance and its history. But I wanted to then get into some of the, the personal perspective, because I've been involved with it for a big chunk of the time that I just described. So there, Ben, doing it for you. Um, personal story part. A lot of, I mean, some of you I know already, but a lot of you have no idea who I am, right? You're like, Debbie Goddard, who is that? What, what's a Debbie Goddard? I don't even know. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll tell you some things. Hopefully be entertaining. Do you want to share? <laughs> no. <laughs> Because I'm afraid with the chair, then there'll be feedback and it'll be terrible. Um, I grew up in Philadelphia. I lived there until I moved to Buffalo to work at the Center for Inquiry. I'm 32. I was born on a rainy Wednesday in 1980 in Philadelphia. Um, and I grew up in a relatively diverse neighborhood. My mom is an immigrant from Trinidad and was raised culturally Catholic. My dad was a Polish Jew. I went to Catholic school. My parents worked really hard to send us to Catholic school because our local school district was terrible. Our high school had a graduation rate of less than 50%. There was a lot of violence. The textbooks were old. People graduated and could barely read. So they sent us to Catholic school. Um, and in our school district, in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, students go through the sacrament of confirmation relatively young. And confirmation is kind of like, you're too young when you're baptized to agree to baptism. So then when you're older and can make these decisions yourself, you reconfirm your Catholicness, kind of like a bar mitzvah. So in my school, which was a small K through eight with about 200 students total, all the sixth and seventh graders went through confirmation every two years. It took up the bulk of our religious education in religion class. And as I was learning about stuff, I realized I wasn't sure I wanted to go through with it um, for a couple of different reasons. I had some questions, and I didn't have answers for them yet. Additionally, I was told that once you get confirmed, you're considered kind of an adult in the eyes of the Lord, and your sins count against you. And so I wanted to forestall that for maybe a couple more years at least because, man, I was sinning all over the place, right? And I figured, like, once I got confirmed, I took the sacraments very seriously. Once I got confirmed, I should live a good life and try not to sin and pray every night, which would be one of my New Year's resolutions, to pray every night. Um, I would have to be a good person, otherwise I might go to hell or something. So I told my teacher, Sister Therese, that maybe I could wait a few years until I got confirmed. And I said, maybe eighth grade, I'll do it. And she said, no, everyone, still, all the sixth and seventh graders are doing it. That's not even an option, right? And I was like, well, I, I don't know. This is a big thing. The sacraments are important. They're these covenants with God. So maybe I can get out of it if I convert to Judaism. <laughs> so, so I talked to my dad about this. And I said, dad, I want to convert to Judaism. Don't tell mom. And I was like, that's great. I was the one of the four kids that would go to synagogue most with my dad, so this didn't seem too odd to him. He said, great, it's great timing. We can talk to Rabbi Greenberg. You can actually start preparing for your bat mitzvah. So I was about that age, and so I thought, oh, crap. These are my two options, the religious commitment ceremony to be Jewish forever or the religious commitment ceremony to be Catholic forever and ever. 
And that's a big deal. So I remember biking around on a Sunday, and I was supposed to tell my teacher the next day who I chose for my sponsor. I was the last student. The sponsor is an older Catholic or someone who's been Catholic for a long time who guides you through the sacrament of confirmation. You can ask your questions to them. They help teach you about catechism. Um, and I didn't have one picked. So I thought, what am I going to tell her? Am I going to tell Sister Therese that I'm Jewish now? Or do I choose a sponsor? Well, which God is God? Which God is more likely right? I knew they weren't the same. I knew there was no way to reconcile Catholicism and Judaism. You know, either Jesus is the Messiah or he isn't. And that's a big difference. And it still surprises me when people are like, they worship the same God. Really? Because <laughs> I don't know. I, I, did the Messiah come, didn't he? That seems like a really a crux issue, right? <laughs> um, the Jews don't think he did. So I'm thinking, well, Jewish God, and I'm imagining kind of a Moses-y figure with a beard. And Jewish God, he hasn't sent the Messiah yet. They're still waiting. Well, that kind of makes sense because, you know, the Messiah was supposed to bring a thousand years of peace or something, and that didn't really happen. But, like, the Catholic God, Jesus was the Messiah, and if he wasn't the Messiah, like, how did he come back from the dead? I don't know. So maybe they're right. And, but if the Catholics are right, then are Jews going to hell? Because I don't think that that's right. But if the Jews are right, then they're the chosen people. What about everyone else? Ah. <laughs> and then I thought, well, what about Hindus? There are Hindus in my neighborhood. I knew almost nothing about them. There was kind of a mythology book in my class. And I was like, they believe in purple elephant-headed many-armed gods. Like, what if they're right? Oh, there's no way that's right. But what if they are? Like, I don't know anything about that. What about the Muslims? I don't know anything about Muslims in sixth grade. There was a mosque, however, next to my local 7-Eleven. And on the outside, it said, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is its messenger. So I thought, Muslims don't even believe in God. They believe in Allah. What if they're right? How do I know? What? There are so many stories. Which ones are true? And then I thought about Greek mythology, because I was thinking about Indian mythology. And this is all like sitting on my bike, kind of leaning against the fence. Like, oh, big deal, big deal. I don't know what to do. What, what about the Greeks? Well, they thought they were right, but obviously no one thinks those gods are right anymore. Well, what about like the Chronicles of Narnia, which I was really into. And I had completely missed all the Christian imagery in, by the way. Um, but what if 2,000 years from now, in the same way that people worshipped Greek gods back then, what if 2,000 years from now, everyone's worshipping Aslan? What if the reason that there are so many stories is because they're just stories? What if there really is no god? And I swear, like, literally eye-opening experience. Like, I felt like I thought that, I blinked, and the world had no god in it. And it made sense. And I looked at the tree, and I thought, there's no God in the tree. There's no God in the sidewalk. There's no God in those people. Like, wow. I need to tell everyone this. <laughs> this is incredible. Like, wow, this makes so much sense. If I explain this, they'll see. I had no friends when I was in sixth grade. So that's why like, I didn't know how things worked. So I went, to <laughs> I went to school the next day. I actually biked home because I was really excited to tell my parents, and they weren't home. Um, and I went to school the next day, and my teacher, Sister Therese, asked me during a recess, who did you pick as your sponsor? And I said to her, Sister Therese, I don't think there is a god. And in my head, the way that this would play out is she would be surprised and then think about it and realize she'd never thought about it before and say, you know, I have to think about this. And she'd go back to the convent that night, and while the nuns were eating spaghetti dinner, they'd be discussing it over dinner. But it would be too big a discussion for them. They wouldn't know the answer, so they'd bring it to the priests. And then the priests would have to discuss it. And then it would be on Time magazine. And it would be huge. Because <laughs> I was the first person in the world to think of this, right? I'd never heard that this was an option before. So I really thought, like, I, wow. This, and it wasn't that I was... Prideful, just this had never been presented as a possibility that you could not believe in God. So that, of course, was not at all her response. <laughs> Sister Therese instead responded, and mind you, in, in sixth grade, I'm like five, seven and a half, and she's tiny. And she looks up at me and she says, What? You listen to me, young lady. You're getting confirmed. Everyone's getting confirmed. And she's like, Storms off. She's upset. I'm shocked. Like, how can I get confirmed now? I'm, I'd be lying to God. That, what? So she storms off. They assign me a sponsor for confirmation, the school secretary, Sister Charles, who's 
as mean as that sounds. And she was my older sister's uh, sponsor. So I get assigned Sister Charles as my secretary, or as my sponsor. And this is a big deal to me. I always took the sacraments seriously, covenant with God and all of that. And I remember talking to my mom. Oh, there's another thing. I got suspended. I got suspended for two days, which meant sitting in a different part of the building in a small office by myself with my spelling homework and a Bible. And meanwhile, you know, I'm reading the Bible and going, wow, these are also obviously stories, just like Greek mythology. Look at all of these stories. And I had no word for atheist, but it just solidified to me this idea that, you know, wow, there really is no God. Um, so yeah, I told my mom about this all, and I had just gotten in trouble, so she wasn't super happy with it. And I was like, babe, she, Sister Therese won't let me get out of confirmation. But if I get confirmed, I have to be Catholic forever, and I don't think there is a God. And my mom was, bless her heart, she was going through nursing school, and mostly I think she didn't want me getting in trouble anymore. Um, she was taking philosophy classes, and so she said, you know, Debbie, well, it doesn't matter if you go through confirmation then, because you're not making a covenant with God if there is no God. I don't know why I didn't think of that. <laughs> so just go through with it so that you don't get in trouble. <laughs> oh, OK, yeah, I can do that. Um, I actually missed the catechism day, like the day you sit with the priest and go through all the questions and stuff so to make sure that you studied, because my mom was graduating from nursing school that day, and I never made it up. I just went through it in religion class. But the day of confirmation, I'm there in a dress, and we go up to the bishop, and my sponsor's hand is on my shoulder. And she didn't really like me anyway, I, I could tell. But her hand is on my shoulder, and the bishop says, do you believe in one true Catholic God? And there's oil involved in things. And I said, no. <laughs> and he's like, bless you, go on. You know. <laughs> he was 89. He actually died a couple years later. He deaf as a post. I had no idea, next child, next child, <laughs> you know, go on. My sponsor, however, heard me. So as we're going back to the pews and she's, my heart's pounding in my chest, like, yeah, 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 I did the right thing. She's death gripping up my shoulder. <laughs> like, and she leans over and says, we'll talk about this later, young lady. And I'm terrified of her, but that's okay. I got through confirmation, yay, everything was done. I had a confirmation name, they made me a card. And for the next year and a half, I avoided the school secretary whenever I could. In fact, like when I had to go outside on the bus line, I would put people between me and the office door so that she couldn't call me in and yell at me. So a couple of years later, eighth grade, I won a scholarship to a Catholic private all-girls school, which was awesome. It was expensive for my family. Uh, my older sister, two years older, had won a scholarship there as well. And if I didn't win a scholarship, I couldn't go to the school. So I was happy, everyone was proud of me. Great job, Debbie, the school was hard to get into. Um, and I got called down to the office by Sister Charles. And she came up to me when I went down there and I thought she was going to congratulate me. And she instead says, I remember what you said at confirmation. And I know that you haven't been going to church. I'm going to tell the nuns at Mount St. Joseph Academy and they're going to take your scholarship away. And I said, no, I've been going to church. I just go to the church in my neighborhood because I was going to an out of parish school. And she's like, bring me a letter from the priest that says it. And I said, he never sees me. I sit in the back. She glares at me. I'm terrified. Meeting's over. I start attending church every week just so that I could be seen so that they don't take my scholarship away. Again, run by the same nuns, the Sisters of St. Joseph. So it seemed likely to me. And man, church is boring. But I went and thought about a lot of things, like if I floated up to the ceiling because my gravity switched suddenly, how cool it would be to climb on the ceiling, which is my old standby for going boring churches, is like walking around the ceiling upside down and climbing around on things. <laughs> Try it, so it's actually fun. Um, but yeah, a lot of it was this solidifying of this idea that like, wow, this is not true. And it was, that was the same year that I learned the word atheist for the first time. It was in my religion book, Atheist and Agnostics, one who denies God and one who does not know whether or not there is a God. And that was the first time I knew that there were others out there who felt that way. Well, I didn't lose my scholarship yet, and I went to Mount St. Joseph Academy. And I started a philosophy club because I had a lot of questions. 
And, but I didn't know anything about philosophy. Heck, I'm a high school freshman. There's not, again, really much interneting. It was 1994. Um, I had encyclopedias and a deep love of Star Trek. And so a lot of the times what we discussed in philosophy club were things like, you know, if we found Vulcans, would they have souls? Or would they be like cats are in Catholic theology? They don't go to heaven or hell because they're not humans because Jesus never visited them. Um, sometimes I'd look things up in the encyclopedia and we'd discuss that. So I ran this club. Um, halfway through my sophomore year in religion class, I wrote a paper that wasn't accepted very well by my teacher about, well, we had to write a paper on a priestly person. And a priestly person is someone who takes Catholic values and ministers to the masses the way a priest ministers to, to a congregation. So people picked their local priest, uh, their grandfather. Mother Teresa was big, of course. Uh, a couple of people did Martin Luther King. And one person did Gandhi, and I did Bob Dylan. <laughs> and the reason I did that is I was actually earnest about this presentation of information. It only had to be four pages, double-spaced. Mine was seven with a bibliography. And I talked about how he was an agent of social change, how his songs influenced a generation that he got their Ford out, and I focused a bit on things like Blowing in the Wind, and Times They Are Changing. I played guitar, I still play guitar sometimes, and I was really into folk music, especially kind of like protest songs and things from the 60s and 50s and 70s. So I justified it. Um, I talked about how his song Hurricane led to the freeing of Reuben Carter from prison. It highlighted this injustice, and change happened, and how great that is. That's not how my teacher saw it. Um, so the day the papers were to be returned, Sister Mary Hummel calls me out of class and holds up my paper and says, what is the meaning of this? And I'm terrified of her, and I say, well, Bob Dylan was an agent of social change. And she says, he was a rock musician. And I say, well, well, that way he was able to get his message out to more people. And she says, he was a Jew. I was like, Whoa. Martin Luther King wasn't Catholic either. And ne neither was Gandhi. And she spins and heads down the hallway, disappears. Now, mind you, this all took place outside of my classroom with the door open. I just got yelled at, and everyone in my class heard me. I'm terrified. She goes off. Eventually, I kind of go back in class, you know, hanging my head. People are chatting. Well, my parents get called in. She had gone to see the school disciplinarian, Sister Karen Dietrich. And Sister Karen's office was right outside of the um, lounge where we would hold our philosophy club meetings every week. So for a year and a half, she'd been listening to our discussions in the philosophy club, which I didn't really know. I mean, there were a bunch of offices off of it. So they called my parents in a couple of nights later and told my parents that they were taking my scholarship away. Because the scholarships were meant to foster good young Catholic women, and it was obvious that I was not one of those. I was not going in that direction. And this is midway through my sophomore year in January. And my parents tell me this, and it like breaks me. I'm, I'm upset. I think I'm going to have to go to the terrifying public schools in my area. I think I've just killed all of my chances for college. I'm ashamed. I'm going to have to tell my friends. I can't come back to school in the fall. My older sister was finishing there. I was really upset that I would get in trouble for asking questions, that I would get in trouble for running a philosophy club. And for this paper, and I wasn't trying to make fun of the process. You know, I meant it, and that I was getting in trouble for that. So that was a mopey rest of the year. Um, but after the, the initial sadness and shame, I started getting kind of angry about it. Uh, fortunately, my parents moved the family to the suburbs that summer, and I went to suburban public school. Yay, no metal detectors there. And I started another philosophy club. But instead of focusing on you know, fun discussions about Vulcans and whatnot, instead, we took a more atheist, secular, academic freedom, freedom of expression angle. Because now this is what I was more interested in. I was pretty mad about what happened. Um, I still didn't know much about philosophy, but I had encyclopedias to access and some internets. So I would look up topics, and our advisor was a good guy. He gave us some ideas. Um, and I ran meetings based on what he suggested. So I learned about Socrates. I present on that, um, but also about atheism. Well, one of my friends from philosophy club a few years after high school, and I didn't even know this at first, she started a campus free thought alliance group at the University of Pittsburgh. So when I was 20 years old that one summer, she called me and she said, hey, I'm going to this conference in Buffalo. 
uh, at this secular humanist organization. I thought he might want to come too. And I was like, wait, a what? Now, it, I knew that she had become an atheist. And part of it was the result of discussion in philosophy club that she started questioning some ideas that she'd never thought about before. I didn't know that she'd gotten so interested in it that she'd gotten involved with this campus free thought alliance group at Pitt. Um, had been in touch with the Center for Inquiry and was going to this leadership conference. So she's like, yeah, it's a secular humanist organization. I was like, a what now? And she's like, it's a student atheist convention. I was like, what? They meet? There's such a thing? <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, I'll go. I contacted the Center for Inquiry. I got a travel grant so to get a Greyhound bus ride up to Buffalo from Philadelphia. You know, we took the bus together. I had no idea what to expect. I hadn't looked it up online. I just basically took the days off and was like, Advent adventure time, going to Buffalo. And we got picked up at the bus station by a van that said Center for Inquiry on the side. And I was like, oh, this is for real. I thought it was going to be maybe like 20 kids at some VFW somewhere. But no, it was for real. They drove us out to the suburbs where CFI is headquartered. And my goodness, there was a building and paid staff and people working on this. Activists, critical thinking, science advocacy. You know, the reasons that I was studying philosophy in college were to be able to teach critical thinking and to have an environment where free inquiry is prized. And no, there was like, I had no idea that there was a movement there. So I got involved. I went back to Philly and joined every group I could. The following year, I volunteered as publications director for the campus outreach program, which was a really good fit for me because um, I got to learn about news worldwide, what campus groups are doing, events and activities, and then publish a monthly kind of email newsletter about it. I started going to as many conferences as I could. Um, and being in Philadelphia, there's a lot going on in that seaboard. So I actually was able to plug in in a big way and had a blast with it. So that's me. <laughs> Go away, thing. Oh, no, I broke it. Uh, so yeah, I was the publications director for a few years. I also, I spent some time in community college where I created a philosophy club again. They actually wouldn't let us create a free thought group because they said there was no academic purpose for it. So we had the same, same constitution, just different name, philosophy club instead of free thought club. Um, when I went to Temple University full time, I thought I would have to drop out of volunteering and doing the newsletter editing. But I had some work study money. And once I found that I could work for advocacy organizations and things, I actually asked CFI if they could hire me as a work study student. And my university said that um, they would allow that as long as I, for every week I turned in hours, I spent at least one day in the office, because otherwise it was all online. So for two semesters, I actually traveled once a week from Philadelphia to New York City, because they opened up an office in Rockefeller Center. And I got to do awesome things there. I helped start the CFI Harlem discussion group. And I helped start campus groups. And I went to lunches. And I did their newsletter there and had a great time. And it's why eventually, of course, they hired me, which was also very exciting. Um, more stuff from student time. This is from a leadership conference in 2001 I attended at CFI headquarters. Um, August Brunsman, who's the executive director of the Secular Student Alliance, is there. Reggie Finley, who was the infidel guy, is there. I'm back here somewhere. Oh, there's some, some people from Americans United and other campus groups are there. Um, this is from a conference I drove to in 2001 in Atlanta. My friend and I attended. We drove overnight from Philadelphia, which is a long and difficult drive to do overnight when you're going to a conference the next day. Uh, it's the first time I'd met DJ Grothy, who was a former student activist. But I'll mention more about him in a sec. This is when we were touring the Center for Inquiry with a bunch of students. Ed Buckner at the time was the executive director of the council. Uh, this photo um, was from the Godless Americans March on Washington, which took place 10 years before the Reason Rally also primarily organized by American atheists, but a lot of organizations joined in. At that rally, we had about 2,300 people rallying in Washington, DC. 10 years later, 10 times that, which was exciting. But I carried the banner for the council. It was a really fun time. As a student activist, I got profiled on BeliefNet with a much more stellar crop of people like Wendy Kaminer and Paul Kurtz. Just as a student activist, I was doing the newsletter going to conferences, uh, working with local groups. They actually profile my stuff. 
But I'm, of course, not the only one with a story like that. So I wanted to take some time to highlight some of the other student leaders and activists that I met um, and, what, and that were involved in the early student free thought movement here and what's become of them. I uh, had on the slide before Derek Arujo. He would founded the Harvard Secular, so Harvard Secular Society, I think in 1995 or 6. He actually was the founding president of the Campus Free Thought Alliance in 1996. He went to Harvard Law, practiced corporate law for a while, but then got back in the nonprofit world for a while, helped build CFI in New York City, worked as general counsel, does a lot of First Amendment law. He actually quit to go back to school to get a PhD in physics. What a guy. <laughs> it's impressive. Austin Dacey was the first um, coordinator of the Campus Free Thought Alliance. He's now an author, a public intellectual, writes for things like The Nation, has a couple books out on these topics. But this was a picture from, oh gosh, 13 years ago when they had a superstition bath at CFI headquarters and they had someone from Saturday Night Live there and he was the DJ. So this was something I pulled up from a website a long time ago. She captioned it, white boy plays that funky music. DJ Grothy, currently the president of the James Randi Educational Foundation, actually got involved with this movement as a student group leader. He was with the Washington University League of Freethinkers in St. Louis. Uh, was involved also, I think he interned in 1999, or volunteered, but he was part of the executive council back in the day before I got involved in the summer of 2000. Chris Mooney was another one who was involved in the 90s, a student group leader at Yale. Uh, he actually volunteered as the PR coordinator. Did I write that? No. Um, I think he was the PR coordinator for the Campus Free Thought Alliance, so he did press releases and helped them coordinate campaigns around the country. He actually credits his experience with CFI with inspiring him to be a science writer, to help get science and critical thinking out there more. And that's what he's doing now. He's published four New York Times bestsellers, Republican War on Science, Storm World, Unscientific America, and recently The Republican Brain. Micah White is an interesting one. And I met him at the first student leadership conference I'd gone to, but he'd actually gotten involved in 1999, I think. He grew up in Maryland. Um, in high school, he moved to Michigan found himself in a more conservative environment and was inspired to start an atheist club. School didn't like it. He contacted the ACLU. They helped him. Uh, actually, the Freedom From Religion Foundation was instrumental in this case. And he wrote a New York Times op-ed about it. Eventually, the school had to say, yeah, you have to have the right to start this. Um, as a result of his experience with activism there, he worked with the Council for Secular Humanism and CFI to form the Young Freethinkers Alliance. Because the Campus Free Thought Alliance was focused on college organizing, he started the YFA to focus on high school organizing. And they went really well um, for a long time. So that started in 1999. He went to college uh, and got involved in pretty lefty politics for a while. He's the editor at Adbusters and one of the two creators of the Occupy movement. So he's been written up. Uh, the New Yorker did an eight-page profile of him, some other things. Really has cultural influence. Started as an atheist high school activist. August Brunsman, a lot of you know, he's the um, current executive director for the Secular Student Alliance. Actually was formerly involved with CFA's executive council and the president of Students for Free Thought at Ohio State University, which has been actually a leading group in all the time that I've been involved as a volunteer. Another person that came out of Students for Free Thought at Ohio State University is Jason Torpy. How many of you know who he is? Few of you? Yeah, he's the uh, president of the Military Association of Atheists and Freethinkers. But I met him when he was a, let's say, wacky, wacky, rambunctious summer intern in the summer of 2000, actually. Justin Trottier started as a student leader in the early 2000s, um, ended up becoming the founder of CFI Canada, which now has, I think, six or seven different branches across Canada. He also sponsored student groups across the country. Maggie Ardiente, I met her once a long time ago, but she now works as the Director of Development and Communications for the American Humanist Association. 
Uh, but she started, again, with student movement involvement. She was involved with the James Madison University Freethinkers. Austin Klein is an interesting fellow, too. He's used the same headshot since at least 2000. <laughs> and it's still his headshot. Uh, he was involved as a student group leader in 1998, 1999, 2000. Um, he was their internet affairs coordinator for the Campus Freethought Alliance. Stayed involved. Um, he's the guide to atheism on about.com. And he's been doing that for a really long time. Very, very prolific. Does tweeting and all sorts of things. So if you've ever seen atheism articles on about.com, that's Austin Klein, former student leader. Hemant, I don't need to say much about. I think you all know him. But you might not know that he was a CFI intern in the summer of 2003, also involved with Students Without Religious Dogma, I think, was the name of the group at uh, the University of Illinois, Chicago. Jen McCright is a blogger. I wanted to focus on a couple of people who are uh, writers. Of course, Jen McCright does Black Hag. She's a public speaker activist, getting trained as a scientist now. J.T. Eberhard, I don't need to say much about. You know he came out of the student movement. Um, the impact of Skepticon alone is incredible. How many thousands of people have gone to that event? A couple organizers I wanted to highlight, people who got involved as students um, in the last 10, 15 years and are still involved. Actually, no, I guess I have new ones. Sid Leroy um, started four student groups at different schools in New York City, is a uh, counselor with Camp Inquiry in New York State, and was hired recently, a year ago, as CFI in New York City's executive director, so coordinating everything there. Dave Moscato was mentioned by Jesse. He was the former president of the Missouri University student group. He just got hired, I think, last week as the PR director for American Atheist. So he's coordinating all the PR right now for the big 50th anniversary conference in Austin. Uh, my two coworkers, I put in here too because I like them and they're awesome. Cody Hashman is the founder and former president of the University of Northern Iowa Freethinkers and Inquirers, which is an award-winning group, one of the top ones in the country. He interned with us uh, in 2011, and we just hired him a couple months ago. He's got a really keen sense for organizing. My other coworker, Sarah, also got involved as a student. In 2008, she founded the group at Indiana University. Um, I think it was 2009, they ran a bus campaign in Indiana. They were inspired by one in the UK. Actually, they went as far north as Chicago for the buses. Um, but that got a lot of attention for their groups, local group and uh, campus groups. And we just brought her into a couple months ago. There's a picture of the one ad, You Can Be Good Without God, Indiana Atheist Bus Campaign. In 2009, I really like this picture, and I'll explain to you why. Um, because I got hired in 2006 after being just a scrappy student group leader person organizing stuff, and they hired me, and I was like, whoa, I get to do this for a job. This is awesome. Well, in 2009, it's the first time they asked me to speak at a national conference for CFI. And they're like, can you put together a panel on student activists? And I was like, yeah. I picked four people. I try to get a group with different backgrounds. So we have a Canadian on the end there. He was a 19-year-old activist from Halifax. Jason Ball from Australia, who flew in, actually, for this conference. Michael Amini from Seattle. And Sarah Kaiser, who I mentioned we just hired from Indiana. She talked about the bus campaign, as well as other activities on campus which was awesome. So the reason, one reason I like this picture is because you know, there I am, we're like six years ago, maybe I was one of these people, maybe. And before that, I was looking at them like, wow, they're so cool. They do the coolest things. I wonder if I can do something like that. Let me try. So to be able to provide the opportunity uh, to get involved and to share what they do to people has been really special to me. So I mentioned Jason Ball. He's an Australian activist. And one thing I wanted to highlight that Jesse didn't talk about much yet was the student group movement in other countries, or the student movement in other countries. Um, Australia has a good network of student groups. Jason's been responsible for a lot of that. I think he's 25, maybe 26 years old now. He was actually inspired to get involved with the movement because he did a program in high school, an exchange program, where he came to a high school in Kansas 
for a good part of a year. And his experience with religious groups in Kansas terrified him. <laughs> so he went back to Australia and started seeing some effects that religion had in government and culture there and said, I need to organize something here. He founded the University of Melbourne Secular Society and got involved with the groups there. And since then, his, he's, he's been incredible. He organized a protest against a pope's visit. Uh, not so much that the pope couldn't come, but that the Australian government was paying so much for them to organize a world youth rally there. Um, he's now the PR director for the Atheist Foundation of Australia and is one of the primary people organizing the every two years Global Atheist Convention, which has been the largest atheist convention in the world. Their last one, last year, brought in 4,000 people. And that's in Australia, a country of what, 22, 29 million, something like that? Small country, big conference. So he's become a spokesperson there. This is him at the Global Atheist Convention. It's not the only thing he's been a spokesperson for, though, recently. And he credits his involvement in atheist activism with inspiring him to take the lead in these issues. He's gay, and he plays Australian rules football, which they call footy because they're Australian and they cutesify everything. <laughs> so he's just recently come out of the closet as a spokesperson for changing the culture of Australian rules football to try to take, to help diminish some of the homophobic stuff that goes in in the culture there. He's gotten such attention for it, oh, that's from an atheist activism thing, that a couple of weeks ago he actually was, he led the Melbourne Pride Parade as a grand marshal. He's been all over the media for this. Again, he's what, 25 years old maybe. This is my friend, Yemi. And Yemi is an interesting one for me. When I started editing um, the campus newsletter back in 2001 as a volunteer, I had reached out to campus groups all over the place and asked them for articles about their events and things on campus, opinion pieces, poetry, whatever. And I found out that we had campus affiliates around the world, which I didn't know before. I was new still to that aspect of things. I'd just been involved in Philadelphia. So I reached out to the University of Ibadan in Nigeria, contacted the student group leader in 2001 and said, hi, my name's Debbie. I'm a volunteer with the Campus Faith Alliance. Uh, I was wondering if you would write up an article about what you're doing on campus in Nigeria. And he said, sure, yeah. In fact, we're organizing a big workshop about superstition right now um, to try to stop people from killing kids who are accused of witchcraft. That's great that I can write up that for your newsletter. What are you guys doing in America? And I mentioned this in Minnesota because at the time, the big issue for the atheist community was trying to get under God out of the Pledge of Allegiance. So I said, you know, we're trying to get under God out of our Pledge of Allegiance. Wow. <laughs> wow. What you're doing in Nigeria is amazing. And this is students at the university. And he's like, yeah, this is actually the only safe place where we can really do this kind of organizing. And so I started up a friendship with Yemi. He wrote things for the newsletter, but also we communicated back and forth because he was very excited that people in the US were paying attention to him. I actually have a bunch of slides more. Ah, terrible. I'm going to skip through some of them. Well, all right, I'll talk quickly. A couple years ago, um, August 2011, I got invited to attend a conference in Oslo. My first time traveling overseas, I was very excited. It was for the International Humanist and Ethical Union. Um, and I went, and I got to meet humanists and atheists from all over the world. I didn't have much time to plan before I went. It actually was like a two-week plan and I was in the middle of moving, so I didn't really pay close attention to what was going on there. I basically printed out my hotel directions and the conference location and went. And didn't realize until I was there for a couple of days that the conference center was a block from the terrorist bomb that had gone off there just before the conference started. I don't know how the heck I missed this online. I, I feel kind of embarrassed because I knew it was in Oslo, but I didn't know it was down right across the street basically from the conference center. Until I was walking one day and we were walking past what looked like a construction site. 
And someone was walking and said, I can't, you know, it's kind of incredible to think that this blast thing just happened here like a week and a half ago. And I was like, oh, what? <laughs> oh, that explains the big building covered in the white sheet in the back. That explains the plywood on all of the windows everywhere that I hadn't really paid attention to. Wow. The cloth face that was broken, there was, that was the fountain they put roses in. Um, let's get through some of these. This was the front of the Congress Center where the Humanist Congress took place. And this was looking up the street from it. And we actually had meetings in these rooms. This is plywood on all of the windows there. In fact, they had to make sure that the building was structurally sound enough for the conference to even continue. Let's get through these. Because in one of the, meet the meeting rooms, the window up at the top was completely cracked. This is another place we had meetings. That window had been blown out. And the theme of the Congress was humanism and peace. But one nifty thing about that conference was I got to meet Yemi in person. I was standing in a room, and I hear my name called from behind me. And I turn, and it was Yemi. We'd become Facebook friends since. you know, And I'd been in communication with him here and there since 2001. But that's him in the back with two activists from Nepal. And it was kind of incredible. Like, wow, we both got involved with this when we were 21 years old. And now we're 31, meeting in Oslo, far, far away from home. You know, and I, found, I asked him, like, what have you been up to? Because I hadn't talked to him for a few years at this point. And he's like, oh, well, I was able to start this organization in Nigeria. I'm finishing up my PhD. I'm focusing on child witchcraft. Here's some stuff that's been happening there. A man plucks 10-year-old boy's eyes for ritual. Why some Nigerians carry out ritual killings. This is a Christian church, actually, advertisement. And they're about to have a conference, or a yeah, meeting for Operation Kill the Witches. So what he did was organize an, something called the Young Humanistas Network. And it says, uh, Stop Stigmatizing Children's Witches. And having seminars across the country about what people can do to try to combat superstition there. There's Young Humanistas Network. That's Yemi in front of another audience. He's also getting funding to create orphanages across the country. And not technically for orphans, but children who have been kicked out of their homes, who have been maimed, uh, accused of witchcraft. And he sent me this picture. Um, one place they were having a training event, they actually ran into this beggar on the street. And he talked to him, and the, guy, the kid said he was just kicked out. He didn't know how long before by his parents because his mother fell sick. And they blamed him for it. And after tying him outside for a week, he escaped and was begging on the street. So they hooked him up with an orphanage. This is what he does. He's a former student group leader in Nigeria. He's still involved with this. That's one of the orphanages. I'm going to skip one person. Well, maybe not. Damn it. Damn it, time. So much to say. <laughs> There's a lot going on uh, internationally. Let's go to you. All right, George. George Ungari, if I'm not mistaken, he's 28 or 29 years old. He actually is the executive director of CFI Kenya, where they just started their fourth university group. This is Maseno University, University of Nairobi, University of Kenya, Moy University Freethinkers. And this is a manual. He asked for a donation to print these, but they're campus organizing manuals that are more Africa-specific that he's been distributing on campuses to students there so that they can get their program started in Nigeria. Or, uh, sorry, Kenya. He organized a trip to the Nairobi, Nairobi National Museum for Darwin Day a couple years ago, because one of the problems there is that science is seen to be a European thing, and it doesn't connect, some people think, with Africans. And we don't have a lot of resources here in the States that could help him. So he's creating new ones to change the narrative that science and reason and secularism are good for all. This is one of the student groups there, the University of Nairobi Humanists and Freethinkers. I wanted to talk about three other people quickly. Three other youths, young activists. Uh, this is Abolash. 
He's in India, and he works at the Atheist Center, which was founded in 1940. I'll show you one of the slides. This is him doing a presentation. I actually got to meet him in person also in Oslo. Uh, so what is the Atheist Center up to? It's kind of interesting because the way that we are, the way that we use the word atheist here is not how he uses it there. He said, right from the inception, Atheist Center adopted a comprehensive approach for sustainable development. It views life as an integrated whole and is striving to build an alternate way of life, a life stance based on a secular humanist atheist alternative. Atheist Center's active association with the freedom struggle and its grassroots, grassroots level work for the eradication of untouchability caste and other parochial considerations brought it in closer touch with the realities of the village scene in addition to its activities on a wider plane. They concern themselves with, a lot with poverty, education, contraceptive education, uh, anti-blasphemy work, uh, scientific medicine rather than village remedies. One project that they did recently was um, magic camps. And they've done this a couple different ways, but this one, they brought in children for a two-day workshop, I think. Yeah. And they showed them how magic works. Here's a trick. Here's how we do it. And the reason was to train them how to recognize ways that people can deceive people. Because they have a problem there with the godmen, people who say that they have supernatural powers. They can give blessings. They can fix things. You know, they can make you rich. Um, and it's harmful. Another activist that's involved in India is Sanal Adamaruku. He's been in the news recently because he was charged with uh, blasphemy against the Catholic Church. There was a cross that seemed to be weeping. He investigated after many, many pilgrims had gone to this facility. He investigated and found that there was actually a sewage leak that it was kind of absorbing and then leaking out. So the holy water that people were blessing, yeah, it was sewage. And he published this. He's the president of the Indian Rationalist Association. And he got arrested for blasphemy. The Catholic Church wasn't too happy with this. Right? But he had actually started as well as a college activist. He started a rationalist society in his university. Another case that he succeeded at, actually, so the, the cross blasphemy case is still ongoing. Um, one thing he succeeded at was challenging a godman that came to an area. He, this godman said that he could basically trample infants to bless them. So parents would bring their children to this man who traveled to villages and have him stand on their children and pay him money to do this. So now Adam Ruku released a press release about this to call attention to it. But the parliament member from the area, a minister and a top priest, defended this ritual in the name of religion and tradition. But two days after a big TV interview hit with pictures like this one to say, like, do you know what he's actually doing? Two days after that, this godman was arrested. And this stopped. One thing you might know him for is uh, on YouTube, he challenged a godman to try to or the guy said that he could kill him without touching him through chance and whatnot. And he said, show me. Let's put it on TV. It went on live TV. It was supposed to only be for a few minutes. For over an hour, this guy danced around him with herbs and chanting, saying that he could kill him. Well, he basically laughed. <laughs> and this made an impact. This had an effect. And he also got involved as a student leader. I think I have one more person. I do have one more. Gulai Ismail from Pakistan, focuses on education of young women, which many of you know is a big issue. Many girls don't get educated at all. She started an organization at the age of 24 called Aware Girls, a young women-led organization working for women empowerment, gender equality, and peace in Pakistan. We're working to strengthen the leadership capacity of young women, enabling them to act as agents of social change and women empowerment in their communities. Uh, one thing that they're focusing on especially is sex ed, which no one gets there. There's been rampant HIV spread. Um, and of course, if you talk to Pakistani officials, they're like, that doesn't happen here. 
you know, women only have one sex partner, so how can that happen, they say. Of course, that's not true. So she educates them on this. So I learned a lot from my experiences, not just at this conference and in connecting with different humanist and atheist activists, and again, not just in the US, which I highlighted some of and Jesse talked about some, but worldwide. Um, much of it has been incredibly inspirational to me. When I found out what was going on in Nigeria when I was 21, um, and how big an issue that is that people could be killed for accusations of witchcraft that superstition and bad thinking can kill, that inspired me to work harder. That showed me again how important our values are in this movement. So I wanted to share some of the things I learned being involved with this movement and starting again like as a student leader. In many parts of the world, humanism, of course, is allied with good action. It doesn't just consist of people getting together once a week or once a month. They actually work to change things. Many humanist initiatives worldwide are led by young people, and many of them take place on college campuses. You know, many of them are also people tied in with education. Uh, there's a government-sponsored humanist university in the Netherlands. There's an atheist center in India. There's um, you know, Gula Lai's work in Pakistan. There's what Yemi is doing in Nigeria. There's the work in uh, Kenya, educating untouchables um, in India. Often, those are the safest spaces to discuss the ideas that challenge cultural norms. And I think that's something that we also can see here. So I've been able to take listening to these people's experiences and seeing some of them grow as activists and leaders, seeing some of them come from the student movement and become movement leaders and whatnot, um, that there are ways to make atheism and humanism and skepticism relevant in any cultural context. And that's been useful to me, you know, moving from Philadelphia to Buffalo, that's been useful to me thinking of how to organize in the South versus how to organize in the Pacific Northwest where the values are different. There's not just one road to activism and leadership and making a difference. I also learned, of course, that humanism is inspiring, that atheist activism is inspiring, that we're really trying to change the world here. And now the movement has over probably close to 500 campus groups worldwide. I know Jesse used the number 423 for SSA affiliates. But there are groups in Australia, and there are groups in Nigeria, and there are groups in Kenya, and there are not quite campus groups in India. They're developing around the world. There are volunteer programs, there are structures for leadership. And it'll continue to grow, especially with the internet's ability to connect people in ways that they weren't able to connect before. So what does the future of this movement look like? It looks like me, and it looks like you. It looks like the students that we can invest in. You know, if I had known people when I started philosophy clubs in high school that could have helped, <laughs> that would have been incredible, but it was the mid-90s, and again, there wasn't much interneting at the time. And it looks like all the people that we're going to see, you know, get involved in this and find that this is worthwhile and that they can make a difference, whether they become teachers or parents with kids and have, can have a voice in homeschool associations or social workers or activists or doctors, and I even put pizza delivery driver in there because that's what I did for five years full time, which is why I'm fat. Um, or writers, bloggers, to have a voice. You know, even delivering pizza, I could speak up when my coworkers said things that I thought were wrong. I can say, you know, your view about same-sex marriage in the Bible and why that should make us vote a certain way, I don't think so. And here's why. Let me tell you about this. So the future of the movement is us, it's the students, it's older, it's all of us together. And whatever it is we can do to make an impact. I know I went over time, I apologize. But thank you, thank you for your time with us. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, organizers, for messing with your schedule. It's okay. I'm the last.